My parents let me take this job after school. It was in a cabinet shop. And I started working there, and anything that was detailed and kind of immaculate, I really liked that kind of work. Then I started at my brother-in-law's violin shop. I just wanted something that was would challenge me a little more in repairing violins, and I did really well at it. And pretty quickly, I was doing the majority of the repairs in the shop, and then I've been here now eight plus years doing this stuff, so. I'm into violin making a lot more as an engineer than a performer, obviously. I like music, but I like listening to music. Um, we're dealing in a margin of error that's a couple of points of a millimeter. So it's a lot more engineering than you might think. You take this piece of wood and figuring out what it's going to sound like at the end of crafting it into an instrument, you have to be very, very specific with your measurements. For the most part, we're copying the greatest sounding violins on the planet. The violin as we know it was made by Andre Amati in the mid-1500s. And then the name that everybody knows, Antonia Stradivarius, is kind of the one that perfected the violin. Since Antonia Stradivarius, the violin really hasn't changed. There are other makers that have made after Strad that are very, very good makers. But since he has that kind of label as the maker for royalty, he's kind of captured that title and he was alive at a very important era for violin making. His craftsmanship was uh, very, very clean for the day. He pushed the design of the violin to an extraordinary amount. Antonio Stradivarius, they estimate, made about a thousand instruments. That is a very happening maker in today's terms. There are a lot of other really competent players here every time I finish an instrument. The moment of truth is when you walk out in the main room and have someone play your instrument for the first time. And you string it up, all the varnish is dried, you hand it to this person. When I'm making an instrument, I am tapping on the pieces of wood and tuning them to certain notes. I'm looking for sound travel through the wood to be very fast. So we measure the speed of sound, how you make the arching, and really, really affects how it's going to sound. How much air mass you make inside the instrument is usually in relation to how big this instrument will sound. And there's not really one right thing because I'll have a performer come in here and they'll play 15, 20 different instruments before deciding what instrument they like. Everyone's looking for something different, so it kind of works out regardless of what you make. Sooner or later, there's going to be someone that really connects with that instrument. Some of the instruments I make are a commission. Usually they'll show me pictures of something they've seen and say, I want the color this or that. More commonly than a commission job, I just make the instrument however I like. And I kind of like making the instrument just however I like because it gives me full creative license. And I would say that's really what differentiates modern violins. We're copying the outlines and the shapes of Stradivarius, but as far as the aesthetic and as far as the um, carving you do on it, it's all in your hand, it's all up to you. If there's no customer saying, I want it specifically this way, I try to use my full creative license on instruments, pushing myself kind of to, the, to my limit on what I can do. I don't want my instruments to sit on a shelf and get dusty somewhere. I want someone to play it and then pass it on to their kid and their child plays it and then their child plays it. That, to me, would be the best thing that could happen to my instruments. I want them to be played and I want them to be used. I want them to be loved. If these instruments that I make are taken care of, they can last three, four, maybe more generations. It does make me want to make my instruments very, very well because you know that this is going to be cherished and loved by somebody. And maybe even for more than the fact that I made it, they might love it just because it's grandpa's. And you want, you want grandpa's violin to be something special. It's kind of an honor in a way. I think there's something special about 
starting with raw chunks of wood. And by the end, you have this intricately carved, beautiful sounding, beautiful looking violin or instrument. And there's no substitute for that. There are a lot of very good makers that have poured time into me. And that's part of what makes me to the level I'm at today. I started this when I was 16 years old. I would like to make instruments that have never been seen before, especially in their aesthetic and their sound. Now that I'm into violin making, uh, I want to be one of the best. <laughs> so the pursuit is going to be make a lot of instruments, get my name out there, get my instruments out there.